Poland was the first country attacked by Hitler's armies. Although occupied by the Nazis from 1939 to 1944, the Polish people preserved their culture by hiding books. Warsaw's underground libraries inspired Madeleine Martin's latest novel, The Keeper of Hidden Books. It's the story of a brave young woman in Warsaw who fights to save her culture, her community, and her dearest friend who is sent to the Jewish ghetto. The book's narrator, Zofia, forms a secret book club as an act of resistance. With the book club, as they're reading these books, it's almost like peeling back layers of Zofia. And each book that she reads really reveals to her a new um, sort of perspective in her life that she had never really considered before. Martin's newest novel is about the power of books to bring us together and to provide solace in difficult times. Madeline Martin, thanks for being here today to talk about The Keeper of Hidden Books. My pleasure. Thank you guys so much again for having me back. Mm -hmm. I really did love your book. Thank you. Very much. And I was so intrigued that I read, I think on the jacket of it, that it was based on a real historical event. Correct. Which I had never heard of. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, I um, was doing research, and I found these incredible journals um, that librarians had written during the Nazi occupation about their efforts and what they were doing to save books from Nazi destruction. Um, when the Nazis first came into Poland, one of their original goals was to pretty much either murder and, or incarcerate 85% of the population and really just leave the remaining 15% as slave labor. Um, so they really attacked the Polish culture. Um, and obviously the Jewish culture as well. And they really wanted to, um, like they closed all the museums, they were destroying books, they weren't allowed to play any music, um, and the libraries were also closed as well. And so they were trying, you know, they were looting books, they were pulping books. And so these librarians um, actually were, like they were detailing their efforts of what they were doing to save these books and hide them away. They had a hidden warehouse, which they never did end up disclosing where that location was. Um, but they did have a, um, like a secret library when the libraries were closed that they actually still lent out books to patrons. And I did find the address for that one, um, but unfortunately it was destroyed in the Warsaw Uprising. Um, and the interesting thing is when I when I found out that research, um, I had already written like half of my book, and um, and I just decided to completely scrap it and completely start over, which is a little bit heartrending, but it really was the right decision. I'm really happy with how the book came out overall. It really accomplished everything that I wanted it to. Wow, that's amazing because that's a big decision to make. It is, and I also um, I also had it due in a few weeks and. <laughs> I, that I, is one leap of faith. It is, yeah. So I, I like, I, I'm such a, a research nerd um, that I never really stop researching while I'm writing, even though I'm sure my publisher wishes that I would. And um, but so you know, I had, I had written this book. I was like halfway done with it. I found that research, and I thought. This is really that, ex that extra component that I really had wanted in my book. This is amazing. So, of course, I started researching even more, and I found this incredible, like, even more details about how the librarians really, throughout the entire Nazi occupation from the very beginning of the attack all the way through the Warsaw Uprising and after, just what an integral part they were really to making sure that there is this community around books and, and libraries still available for people. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I have to do this. And, and I told my friends... Um, um, I was like, you know, I think I can still turn it in on time. And they were like, oh, honey, <laughs> you need an extension, uh, which, you know, ended up working out uh, in the best anyways. My original date that the book was going to come out was the 4th of July. And the new date, because of needing the month extension, was August 1st. August 1st is actually the day that the Warsaw Uprising began. Oh. Um, and 5 p.m. is considered W hour, which is when they actually started the battle. And so to this day, it's such a powerful day that um, even in Warsaw today, all um, at 5 p.m., the entire city goes completely silent mm -hmm. and all these alarms and sirens start blaring um, in honor of all the brave men and women who fought back against the Nazis. So um, so it really is, uh, it was really kind of actually humbling like having it right. release on that date because it really just was so very significant. So that that was kind of meant to be. It really, it was very like, serendipitous. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed your mother has a Polish name. 
Oh, Kazmierski, yes. That's my dad's uh, okay. my dad's family, yes. Okay, so are you Polish? Yes, I am Polish. Okay. And, and, um, and that was something that kind of inspired me to want to actually write a book set in Poland during World War II. I really wanted to have an opportunity to sort of explore my heritage a little bit more, um, which is funny because... Um, you know, not to get too much into the nitty gritty details of the history, but um, Poland was originally like three different kind of countries. And so my family is from Poznan and researching Warsaw is kind of like going to North America, but you go to Canada, but your family's really from from the United States. Right. You know, I mean, right. so it's it really is right. very vastly right. different. Right. So and and studying it there and doing the the sort of like span that you did from 1939 yes. to 1944. Right. Very high stakes because Poland was the first country to be invaded. Correct. By Germany. And so we kind of saw this whole progression of World War II through what happened in Warsaw, this beautiful cultural city right. suddenly turned dark. Right. And, and it really would be almost like New York City. Like imagine New York City being completely occupied by a foreign, like by another country. And, and that's really what it was. You know, they never even thought that Warsaw would ever be attacked because they would, you know, it was a city of, of learning and enlightenment and beauty and art and culture. And to think that that they knew that the war was coming, mm -hmm. but they thought it would be like in Gdansk, you know, like right. kind of in the northern part of Poland. They never dreamed that it would ever touch Warsaw, especially not to the degree that it was. And that's what I liked so much, too, is that you focused on these two young women, Zofia and Janina, mm -hmm. and Zofia, very, very strong character, mm -hmm. and Janina, a Jewish Jewish young woman, right. and and Zofia is kind of her protector in some ways, and also the keeper of the books. Just seeing it through their eyes, they, they didn't even dream that this would be happening in their right. beautiful city. Absolutely. Um, you know, with Poland, and you know, when I do my research, I don't just look at World War II for a country. I look at the entire history of that country, the political, economic, social history, you know, because us as Americans, we are the sum of all the parts of our past that, that have created who we are because we learn about it in school, you know, to make sure that we don't repeat, repeat certain things, to make sure that we can be better going forward. And, you know, it's very much the same um, when I'm doing my research to make sure I understand these, these characters. And in doing my research in Poland, I realized over 120 years they had been occupied by Russia. Um, after the Treaty of Versailles was signed after the First World War in 1918, they were finally awarded their independence after, you know, over a century of, of generations fighting for this freedom. They had just celebrated 20 years of independence before the Nazis came in. And even after the Nazis, the Soviets had them until 1990. So, I mean, you know, she really, Zofia and Yanina, were really born in this, like, 20-year pocket of freedom. And, um, and so, you know, I was thinking... You know, because I try to make my characters really specific to the culture. Like, I, I do uh, about 10 months of research before I even actually create these characters because knowing about the country is so important. And so I thought, you know, with Sophia's character, I was like, oh, she's going to be rebellious. She's going to be fiery. And that's really where I got the idea for her having kind of like that that uh, fire to her. Yeah, I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that, how these characters came to be, because they're so well-formed. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, honestly, if a character has any more than like two or three lines, the odds are I have an entire story that nobody <laughs> will ever know about. Um, and I actually, you know, it's funny because I actually pull up pictures online from that time period and I use those pictures. So I can never share them because it might be somebody's grandmother. Um, at one point, my dad was looking through them and he looked at one picture and he said, is that Bing Crosby? And I <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually, <laughs> but it was also Antoine from the librarian. Okay, okay. So, um, but you know, I just like having that visual for right. those characters. And then I have an entire background. I have like what they want, you know, their parents. Like, mm -hmm. I, I really do flesh things out. And when I was first writing the book, it was going to be a dual protagonist where I was going to have Zofia and Yanina's point of view. Um, but then when I found the information about the libraries, I knew that it was just too big. Already trying to write from September 1939 uh, all the way through May 1945, right. it was like trying to put lightning into a jar. And then adding in that extra element, it was just coming out all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I realized, OK, I just need to have one protagonist, which of course meant I had to completely redraw Zofia's character and kind of soften some of the harder edges a little bit more that, that Yanina would have offset. Mm -hmm. So um, it was quite the undertaking. <laughs> You know, she protects her, you know, really at 
all cost, even at her own peril, until she realizes she's really endangering her. Right. Then yeah. she backs off. Correct. And that was, you know, for me, like writing that scene was a very powerful um, scene because it really is sort of the the culmination of helplessness, yeah. you know, where you get to this point where you think you're fierce, you think you can do anything. Why is nobody protecting right. these people? Right. And then finally she stands up and nobody, nobody stops and helps. Everybody right. just walks around right. and pretend like it's not happening. And then it's not her who gets the retaliation. Mm -hmm. It's the person that she's trying to protect, right. the person that she loves. And, yeah. and you know, going to the heart of really what, what, why people felt so helpless in that particular situation and why more people didn't stand up and, and just, you know, fight initially. You know, I think it's so easy for people to look back in history and say, why didn't people just rebel mm -hmm. against this? You know, why didn't they just like, why didn't they just stand up and say, we're not going to do this? Part of this book is really to try to help people understand how something like this could happen. Because I think if people understand more how this could happen, it will hopefully prevent this from ever happening again. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it was it was sort of a, you know, such a surprise to them, I think, that the extent of how Germany attacked Poland, I don't think anybody really expected that to happen on that scale. Right. And then, as you say, you know, this attack on the whole intellectual world, artists, books, ideas, the whole culture. Right. I don't think anybody expected that. No, uh-uh. And I mean, even even school, yeah. they weren't allowed to go to school past the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. um, they could only, they were only allowed to learn to count up to, it was 100 or 300, and they could only know enough German to answer, um, to take orders, really. And so they had like, and, and the Polish underground is really one of my primary inspirations for writing this book because the Polish resistance, like this underground movement that they had, um, they, they were the most cohesive resistance group in all of Nazi occupied Europe. Um, they actually had underground, when I say underground, I mean more like clandestine rather than like yeah. literally underground. They had these underground schools for children where they would teach them, and they could only teach four and five people at a time. They had to move the location of the class around. If people were found, they would be, you know, arrested and even killed in some cases. But um, at the end of the war, they had, like near the end of the war, over a million of these schools in Poland. And they ranged from um, elementary school all the way through graduate programs in college. I mean, really, oh truly gosh. incredible. Um, but that wasn't, you know, where it stopped. They had, they had, you know, departments to to further culture and art. They would they would support <laughs> artists to be, still be able to engage in their craft, um, to make sure that they still had that Polish culture of art and everything still thriving. And um, I mean, really, it's truly incredible when you look back at at really what they were able to still completely continue to accomplish. Sophia, in her efforts to keep books alive, you know, is just so compelling. I, I remember the one scene where it's actually young guards, I guess, who come and, and physically tear up books. And it's so... Yeah, that yeah. was the Hitler Youth Group. They were literally children. Was that I mean, true? they were children, yeah. So they, the Germans who were living in Warsaw, because they had, you know, they had the Wehrmacht and they had like the SS there, but they also had people living there. They had whole neighborhoods that um, that that Hitler had declared were going to be German neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and they had signs posted out front that said, um, uh, "No Jews, no Poles, no dogs." And nobody was allowed to go in except people who were German, and they would have families that were living there. And they were living in these idyllic homes and these beautiful streets. And these children would come in, and they were part of the destruction of the books. I mean, they, they saw them as, um, you know, as being responsible for horrible ideals that they didn't want the rest of the world to have. Um, and so that's why they were destroying them. And they knew that um, the last time, like, they, they discovered that the books that they were sending for pulping, the people who were driving them were actually taking them and selling them on the black market. And so that's why they started to actually physically destroy them before sending them for pulping so that they wouldn't have any more street value. I noticed that your other historical novels are also kind of libraries, books. Is that something really close to your heart? Yeah, 
I'm a book nerd. <laughs> I can't help mm-hmm. it. Um, you know, for me, books and reading, it's just such a ubiquitous part of my life. You know, I'm either thinking about a book that I want to read or I'm thinking about a book that I've read um, and, you know, like what the plot is going on. Or I see something that reminds me of something I read in a book. Uh, and even as an author, I'm always kind of watching for little things like mannerisms of somebody that I see walking by that I might slip into a character or, you know, something that might inspire a scene in one of my books. And, and so it really is just it's such a big part of my life that um, that I like to sort of slide that element into my plots and into my characters. I have to ask you, um, as a resident of Florida, <laughs> and um, with what's going on today, was any of that any in your mind at all about the you know sort of censorship of books and what was going on back then and any parallels at all? Um, actually, no. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, when I write um, like my World War II's, I kind of have blinders on and I'm in this like fully immersed world where everything is this book and writing this book. And so um, I actually kind of am glad for it because that means that I didn't write this book with an agenda, which I hope makes it penetrate hearts and minds a little bit more organically rather than people feeling like they're being force fed information. But um, I actually really didn't even draw the parallel, um, like, you know, draw that correlation until one day I was going through my galleys, which is kind of like the last thing that you read before you send it to print. And um, I was like checking the news, procrastinating. And I happened to see this article that was talking about a list of um, new books that were being banned in the state of Florida. And that's when it really did connect. I was like, oh my gosh, this book, you know, is really unfortunately very timely. And, um, and that really, like, it was really heartbreaking, especially knowing the depth of what, like, keeping that literature from people and really obstructing these kind of, I mean, because really these books that are being, that were being banned, they were giving faces and names to people who were being persecuted. And if you keep somebody faceless and nameless, it's easier to hate them. And when you have a face and when you have a name and you know you've walked in their footsteps because you've read their stories, you love those people. And, and that's what reading is, right? It's empathy and it's love. Yeah. yeah. And the books were a solace to people who had no other solace in that time. Oh, absolutely. Um, the library went because it did run for a little while and they actually even increased the price of the library for people to attend because you did have to pay a fee to attend the library and um and even with the war going on the um, membership was up significantly because people wanted books to read they wanted that escapism and especially young people it was huge for young people to go to the library Um, and then when it closed it really was completely devastating for the community How did you make the decision to have that time span from the entire war, 1939 to 1944? You know, I feel like, um, like for me at least, the what happened in Poland, everyone knows that Poland was attacked. But I feel like, you know, for me, I really didn't know the depth of really what transpired in Poland. Everybody knows about the French resistance, SOE agents, and, and, you know, what happened during the Blitz. And I feel like, you know, Poland is almost sort of like this kind of grayed out, like we know that's where it started. And and when I started really researching what the population went through and, and, you know, with the libraries, like how they really did have hope, not just the libraries, but also just the, the resistance as well, what they did leading up to the Warsaw Uprising. Like if I just told you about the Warsaw Uprising, but you didn't see all of that persecution, it wouldn't have that impact. And I thought, you know, this is a story that I want to tell from beginning to end. And I'm not going to lie, at one point, I really wish that I could have had like three books, like a saga, um, <laughs> because there's um, there's so much more that I, I wish I could have put in. I actually, I used over 100 nonfiction books to create this book. Wow. And I had over 15 spiral bound notebooks that were filled with handwritten notes. And somebody asked me in an interview the other day, how many of those notes from that notebook, those notebooks made it into the book. And I honestly, probably about 30%. Um, I would have loved to have put more, but I also have to say that that other 70% that didn't make its way in there, um, you know, it really, it helped to make that world alive in my head that I could put it on the page. What is your process then on research? How do you do that? 
well, my uh, male people hate me because I order <laughs> tons and tons and tons of books. So they don't even deliver it to the mailbox anymore. They'll just bring those boxes to my door, <laughs> grudgingly, I'm sure. And <laughs> you always know when I'm starting a new book. Um, so then I, you know, I really go through those. I, I go for about um, six months, and then I, I decide, okay, I need to, you know, travel and, and go to the country that I'm writing about. And so I put together a list of things that I need to get from that travel, um, you know, whether it's information that I really can't find in the books that I'm looking for, because some things are a little bit harder to find. Um, I also um, try learning the language while I'm doing all of my research, because it really does help with the research. Not that I can read Polish, but when you can say the words in your head rather than just skip over words because your brain doesn't understand them, it sinks in more, if that mm -hmm, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so then I reach out to private tours, uh, tour guides, and I kind of give them this list of the information that I need. And I've had some of them say, you know more about my country during World War II than I do. <laughs> you might want to go with somebody else. And then other ones say, you know, oh, I, I don't know all of this. I know some of it, but I'll find out. And, and I'm so excited to work with you. Um, because, I mean, people love to share their history of their country. And people are proud of their countries. And especially, you know, um, the woman who, who was our tour guide, um, she put together different tours that range from eight hours to 16 hours. Um, I mean, she was amazing, just this wealth of knowledge that she had. And and she loved that I, first of all, knew so much going into it, but also that I wanted to know more, that I wanted to have the real truth of the story to tell. So I went there for two weeks. My mom came with me. You know, it's funny because my um, my oldest came with me when I went, to, when I was doing research for the librarians by, my oldest came with me to France and my husband came with me to Portugal. My mom found out I was going to Poland and she said, oh, dibs. <laughs> <laughs> so she came with me. We were there for two weeks and went to all the museums. You know, we did the tours and everything, ate all of the delicious food, just, uh, just, just soaked it all in. And, um, and then I went back home and then, you know, so it ends up being about 10 months total of research. And then I realize, oh my gosh, I have like two months to write this book. And then I have to make sure that I have my plot, um, my characters, and then I frantically write. <laughs> what was it like to do that with your mom? It was really wonderful. So my mom is a, a huge fan of mine. She's a big supporter. Um, she she's always just been so like loving and supporting, uh, supportive when it comes to my books. And in fact, she's usually the person who reads the galleys last before they finally go to print. And so having her come on this trip with me, and knowing that when she read the book, she was going to be seeing really the research that we had done together come to life in the pages of my book, and that made it really special. So when you go on one of these trips, would you say that that, um, that sort of soaking it up and immersive experience really, you know, kind of gives a dimension to the writing? Absolutely. I feel like um, before I travel, everything is kind of black and white. And then when I do travel, it's like it's vibrant, bold colors that really just fill in in my head. And it, it really just brings everything to life so much more. I actually usually walk about 25,000 steps when I go on these trips because I want to actually walk the path that my characters would have walked. So when I'm thinking of them where they're running or wherever, I'm, I'm literally seeing those in my head because I have walked it so many times. Is there some of Warsaw left that was at all original? Partly. So um, so Warsaw really took significant damage during the war. First, during the original attack in September 1939, that never was completely fully repaired. Um, and then later on during the Warsaw Uprising, there was significant damage. They were driving tanks through the city. Um, Old Town was completely destroyed. Um, obviously, the Warsaw Ghetto had been entirely razed. So when the Soviets came in and the Nazis were running out, they stopped to destroy the buildings that they knew were, were very dear to the Polish culture, um, to the, you know, the, the heart of Warsaw. They blew up um, libraries. They blew up um, the palace. And the way they did this is they drilled holes into the building and stuffed it full of dynamite and then blew it up. And they were very strategic about it when they blew up um, the libraries. They went through the floors on the second and third floor, and they blew those up, and they made sure the bottom floor was an entire conflagration. So it like funneled all of the books into the first floor so that they would all burn as maximally, uh, like to maximum capacity, I guess. So um, I mean, so 85% so of Warsaw was destroyed when the Nazis left. So 
to rebuild it, they went through and um, when the Soviet Union was there, like the Poles came back because after after the Warsaw Uprising, there was like a thousand people left in the entire city. And when people started to come back, they wanted to rebuild Warsaw. So they would find as big a chunk as they like bigger chunks and they would rebuild buildings around those chunks. So today, I mean, think about like almost like a citywide jigsaw puzzle, right? So to this day, when you go to Warsaw, you'll see chunks of buildings that will be darker stone that are sometimes even still riddled with bullet holes and chunks taken out from blasts. And it will be built around new material. And really because it's just sort of like piece together, which is impressive to me because I have no patience when it comes to puzzles. Like, <laughs> I'm like the person that'll take a thousand piece puzzle, I'll make the frame, and then that's about all I get. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I can't imagine yeah, the yeah. patience and yeah. the love that that would have really taken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us about the band book club. This really started kind of me thinking about Zofia, like I said, really making her like a very like rebellious kind of a person and thinking, well, you know, what would a rebellious reader do when Hitler's knocking at the door of their country? And, you know, I thought, okay, well, I think she would read books that were being banned by Hitler um, in his country. And what better way to read than with friends? And so that's where the idea for the book club came about. And when I first thought of it, I thought, oh, this is going to be really fun. I'm really excited about this. I had no idea the amount amount of work that I had cut out for myself. So, um, you know, I had to, first of all, make sure that they were books that were banned. That was actually probably the easiest part. I had to make sure that the books had been translated into Polish. Um, I had to make sure that I had read the book or would be able to read the book before I incorporated it into my story. And, um, but most importantly, like with the book club, as they're reading these books, it's almost like peeling back layers of Sophia. And each book that she reads really reveals to her a new um, sort of perspective in her life that she had never really considered before. And, and that really does kind of go back to the importance and the beauty of books. So I had to make sure that each of these books that she was reading also carried a significance in her life and, and had a meaning for why she happened to have that certain um, realization at that time because of having read that book. So it was truly a labor of love, putting together the book list of all of the books that that Zofia reads. But I did love how you tied those in there like that. Thank you. And, Thank you. And had that, you know, that sort of significance with each one of them. Thank you very much. I really them, appreciate yeah. that. I really wanted it to kind of be the heart of the book. Yeah. Your writing system, your writing, how do you write? Where do you write? How often do you write? So I write at home because I emote a lot while I'm writing. And I would love to be one of these, like, you know, cool authors who goes with their cute little messenger bag to Starbucks and has their little thing all laid out. But the problem is... Um, I like, I'll be like writing and it'll be like an angry scene and I'll be like scowling. And I'm sure somebody would be like, why is that woman looking at me like that? And then if it's a sad scene, if my readers are crying, I, chances are likely I have cried even more. (laughs) And so, you know, I would be sitting there like blotting my eyes, like crying, like, you know, writing. Um, so I'm better off writing at home. My cats say thank you for that because they like to snuggle up with me. Like I have one that goes on the floor and then one that sits in a little hammock on the window. Um, and My schedule for writing is chaotic because I am a mother and I have just finally graduated from the chauffeur phase for the most part. My oldest has just finally started driving, so I feel like I've quit a part-time job. Um, But really, for the most part, it's just kind of writing and working in bits and pieces where I can between the kids. Um, You know, it's funny because way back before I started writing full-time, I've only been writing full-time for about two and a half years. Before that, I was working full time, writing about six to eight books a year, and you know the kids were almost a full time job as well. So I used to say, oh, I was a full time business analyst, full time author, and full time mom. So now the kids pretty much think that I'm just there at their beck and call because I'm home and obviously not doing anything, right? And so now I joke that I'm a full time mom with this little writing gig on the side. Right, right, right. right. They don't think they don't think writing's a job. No, no, yeah. they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they're like, hey, mom, can you bring me? like bring me my lunch I forgot it you know (laughs) whatever or just appointments and everything so it really is kind of trying to fit in writing wherever I can Um, but also you know now that COVID is um, I guess done-ish you know there are so many more author events going on now Um, which has been wonderful because it really gives me the opportunity to come out and meet readers. And um, But, you know, it does take me away from my writing because, you know, you're traveling and and doing events and everything. And so, um, so, you know, that's also kind of part of it as well. So it really is 
doing as much as I can around everything. <laughs> can you tell us anything about what's next, what your next book might be? Yes. So my next book is called The Book Lover's Library, sending a trend here. <laughs> and um, it is set in Nottingham, England. And it is um, about a widow whose daughter has to be sent away um, as an evacuee during Operation Pied Piper um, when all the kids were sent oh. out of major cities because Nottingham had a lot of mm -hmm. factories where they were making munitions there. And um, and she part of it is also her working for the Book Lovers Library and, and kind of finding herself when she didn't realize that she was lost. So Great. thank you. And that one is, if you go to my website, MadelineMartin.com, mm -hmm. it's there. Um, it's not really live on a lot of vendors yet, but if you add it to your want to read on Goodreads, I usually go through and I do status updates periodically. Okay. okay. So readers can kind of follow along if they want to know how that book is progressing as time goes on. And when will that be out? Or do September you know? 2024. Okay. Yes. Great. Great. Well, Madeline Martin, thank you so much for being with us today. I really enjoyed your book. Thank and you. And I wish you the best of luck with it. And your next one as well. Thank you so much. And thank you again for having me back. It's always fun chatting with you.